Greetings, dear friends. You are certainly aware that there are various books in the Bible. And I wonder if you ever thought about the purpose of each book. The first five books, the law, consist of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the first book, Genesis, means beginning. It describes beginning of the world, recreation, recreation of this earth, and uh, generally of all the, the God created. It also relates about the flood, and it also tells us about Israel as a family. The second book of the law, Exodus, uh, the word Exodus means going out. It shows the bondage of Israel in Egypt, the coming of the house of Israel out of Egypt, and God making an agreement with them. The book also speaks about the redeeming of the house of Israel. The third book of the law, Leviticus, means the priesthood tribe of Levi. In that book, God gives instructions concerning the laws, worship, and priesthood of the house of Israel. Leviticus means specifically pertaining of Levi. The number four book in the uh, section of the law in the Bible is Numbers, which obviously, its meaning is obvious, it means numbering or census. It gives history of the house of Israel as a nation, uh, the 40 years that that house spent in the wilderness, also the journey of the house of Israel to the promised land, then the census of the people of the house of Israel and the inheritance of each tribe. The fifth book in the law section of the Bible, Deuteronomy, means actually second law or, more precisely, repetition of the law. Now, laws had been given to the house of Israel throughout the book of Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers. Deuteronomy rehearses and expounds these laws with applications just prior to the house of Israel entering the promised land. Then the second section of the uh, Holy Scriptures is the prophets, which consists of six books. In those uh, prophetic, let's call it prophetic, section of the books, we have former prophets, Joshua through Kings. And uh, then we have the letter prophets, Isaiah through Malachi. So, let's first see the uh, former prophets, Joshua through Kings. The former prophets, uh, they deal with the house of Israel having the law of God without God's spirit. Their faith is only in what they could see. Actually, there is no faith. It deals with the house of Israel's future in the land, which will be glorious and wonderful after the return of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have as the first section in former prophets... Uh, actually, that was used to be one book before it was later divided into two. We have Joshua and Judges. The second book that was later divided was uh, Samuel and Kings. And let's see, uh, basically, the meaning of those books. Joshua means Jehovah or the Savior, actually G uh, Jesus. And Judges actually refers to, uh, it speaks about rulers. So history of Israel's settlement into the promised land under Joshua, that's what these books are talking about. And they also talk about the priests and their future under the priests. These books, Joshua and Judges, they cover Israel's conquest of Canaan and their first 300 years in the land, a time of losing and regaining their position in the land because of disobedience, and the disobedience was mainly Sabbath breaking. Now the... Uh, Second book, Samuel and Kings. Not the kings, the meaning is obvious. It's about kings. And Samuel means ask, asked of God. Now these books are called books of the kingdom because they show the history of the house of Israel ruled by judges and kings, mostly kings, being first, it's being first a divided kingdom. Then it was united under King David. And then it was divided again when Solomon's successor came into power. Now David is the future king of the house of Israel, and Elijah the prophet, those two figures, they play very important roles in three books. These books are an excellent introduction to the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now we have the also prophets are being divided into former prophets and later prophets. Former prophets uh, is basically a summary of both sections, that will be Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, those with the former prophets, and then the latter prophets will be Isaiah through Malachi. Uh, Joshua, 
informal prophets, we have Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. So a summary of both sections is basically what it is. Uh, Joshua, uh, the book describes the house of Israel brought into the land under the priests with God keeping his covenant. Judges, they describe the house of Israel in the land where they break God's covenant and the priesthood fails. Uh, the books of Samuel show the house of Israel is still in the land. God shows mercy by appointing prophets and a king whose throne will be established forever. And finally, in the books of Kings, the house of Israel is ejected from the land because, you know, man broke God, God covenant with God and with David. Now, the later prophets, Isaiah through Malachi, uh, in those books, we have God who predicts that even though priests and kings have failed, through him the Messiah would be sent and God's purpose and blessings for the house of Israel and all the world would be secure. So we have now the uh, books of these later prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and later minor prophets. So these three are called the major prophets because of the uh, size of their books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And then we have these minor prophets. We have 12 prophets who are called minor prophets because of the sizes, again, of their books. Now, Isaiah means the salvation of Jehovah. And in that book, basically, is, Isaiah is called the messianic prophet. He understood by looking at the history of the house of Israel, which is described in the books of Samuel and Kings. So he understood by looking at the history of the house of Israel under man's rule that the results was terrible and the result was just failure. So Isaiah looked to Israel, especially to Judah as the nation through whom the Messiah Jesus Christ would come to rule all nations successfully. The next major prophet Jeremiah, the meaning of his name is whom Jehovah raises up. Now Jeremiah lived during the final devastating of the nation of Judah he was the last prophet to proclaim that if Judah would repent, God would save them from Babylon. God rejected the human king over Judah because of disobedience and prophesied of David's righteous branch being raised up, which is what happened because you might remember that it was Jeremiah who, who basically transplanted uh, the throne of David, removed it from the promised land and transplanted it into the scattered Israel, basically on the British Isles. Then Ezekiel, the main, uh, the book of Ezekiel, the word, uh, the name Ezekiel means God strengthens. Now Ezekiel was a very <laughs> specific character because he was a captive in Babylon 11 years before Jerusalem was destroyed. And when he was the prisoner of war, God began working with him. Now Israel had been captured 120 years before that, and Ezekiel prophesied against Israel nevertheless, which is a future prophecy, and he predicted the reestablishment of the house of Israel as a nation when all would know God is God. Now we come now to minor prophets. Each prophet concerns himself with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, or a nation dealing with them. Uh, in the book of Jonah, for example, it would be Assyrians. Now the prophets give the problem, the cause, and the prophecy that God will restore the kingdom with his government on earth, ruling all nations. Now the letter prophets, uh, these letter prophets, we mentioned them, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the 12. Uh, here is a summary of each section. And Isaiah, the book of Isaiah shows the restoration of the throne of David. The book of Jeremiah uh, gives us restoration of the 12 tribes by a new covenant. The book of Ezekiel speaks about restoration of the land and re-establishing the 12 tribes of Israel. And then we have the 12 prophets. They speak about restoration of the throne of David through Jesus Christ. Now, in the section uh, of the Bible called the writings, we have the uh, hymns or royal books. We have 11 books altogether. In that the writings or the wisdom books, we have Psalms, we have Proverbs, the book of Job, and then later we have the Megiloth, which are basically the uh, the holiday books. Uh, in those writings or wisdom books is also enumerated as the Song of Solomon, the Book of Ruth, uh, and the Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, the Book of Esther, uh, the Book of Daniel, uh, the Book of Ezra and Nehemiah, which used to be one book, also Chronicles, and uh, that will be 
that would be it as far as the Old Testament is concerned. Now, the writings or hymns or royal books, altogether there are 11. The first of all, among those books, of course, are the, uh, are the Psalms, or, well, their meaning is basically praises, praises God, you know. They're called in Hebrew the Book of Praises. And the character of David, the author, is vividly portrayed. It's a man after God's own heart. Psalms are compared by many to the Pentateuch, the structure into five sections, with each relating to one of the first five books of the Bible. Psalms also contain God's counsels concerning men and his obedience, concerning the house of Israel as a nation, concerning the sanctuary in relation to God and man, and the house of Israel and the nations of the earth, and finally concerning God and his word. Now, in the section of Proverbs, Proverbs means to rule. Uh, it's called Mishlai in Hebrew, and as the title of this book indicates, Proverbs are words which are to rule and govern our lives. This book could be called a book of practical ethics. Solomon provided, you know, he proved actually by personal experience that the commandments of God are the best for humankind. There is no other alternative. The third book, the book of Job, in those wisdom books, Job, well, the word itself, the, the name itself adequately means afflicted. You know, God names books according to what its main theme contains. Affliction is what Job experienced throughout the book. We are to learn why affliction comes on us because of our faults, not God's. And we are to learn from them that God is righteous and from him comes all our righteousness and that suffering for righteousness sake is a glory to God. Now, within those wisdom books is the Megiloth section. The Megiloth are the following five books found in the writings. And a specific book was read on one of the holidays or Jewish national festivals, since these books contained the lesson uh, uh, that the festival pictured. The lesson of the five books would be, God chose the house of Israel to be his wife and inherit all spiritual blessings with him. That's the theme of the Song of Songs. Then through Jesus Christ all people will become spiritual Jews and be partakers of his matrimony. That's the point of the book of Ruth. Although God will punish his people for their spiritual adultery, as we see in the book of Lamentations, he will establish his kingdom on this earth, which is written in the book of Ecclesiastes, and he will deliver all those who forsake Satan and his ways, which is portrayed so vividly in the book of Esther. So in the Song of Solomon, it's a song for or by Solomon, and this book was read at Passover, the event God chose to take the house of Israel as his wife. It shows God's approach to human physical love. In the book of Ruth, uh, Ruth was a gentle woman. She was the grandmother of King David, who shared the inheritance of the house of Israel because she married a descendant of Abraham, Boaz, Pentecost depicts God's spirit and the time of the first fruits of God, so Gentiles have access to God's spirit and the first resurrection through Abraham's seed, which is Jesus Christ, of course. Then Lamentations, the book of Lamentations, uh, it comes from an exclamation of pain in Hebrew language, it's, it's alas. It's read on 9th of Ab, usually the, it's always the month of August. It's the date that the temple and Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon. It is possibly the prophecy of the righteous Josiah, righteous Josiah's death, the, the death of the righteous king Josiah, which is described in 2nd Chronicles chapter 34, verse 24 through 28. Uh, Lamentations, that book is written to show the utter destruction of Jerusalem because of a sinning people and a corrupt ministry. One author has entitled this book a funeral dirge over the desolation of Jerusalem. The book, the book of Ecclesiastes means assembler or convener. Uh, well, the Greek word for that will be church, but as you know, that word does not appear in the Bible. The Bible contains the word kachal in Hebrew, meaning congregation, convocation, and also uh, uses the Greek word in the New Testament called ecclesia, meaning exactly the same, the congregation of people. Now anyway, Ecclesiastes shows the emptiness of this life's pursuits if only, if our only goals are physical. You know, life 
can only have meaning if our main goal is God's kingdom. Therefore, the conclusion is to fear God and keep his commandments. So it's this book is read through during the Feast of Tabernacles, which indeed that feast depicts God's kingdom. Then the book of Esther is read at the Feast of Purim, which is, of course, National Jewish Feast. It's not pagan, so there is nothing wrong with it. Uh, and it's read at that feast, which commemorates the deliverance from the Jews' enemies. Last book of the five books in Megiloth is this book of Esther. So after God restores his kingdom and government on this earth, all who are spiritual Jews will receive deliverance from Jesus Christ the King. Satan will have been put away and there will be peace. Esther was responsible for saving the entire Jewish nation from which came the future savior of the world. How beautiful. Then we have in the, uh, in the wisdom section, the book of Daniel. The name Daniel means God's judgment. Now, Daniel is not listed among the prophets, which will probably be a surprise to many of you. Why? Because he dealt only with Gentile nations, not with the house of Israel. His entire book is dealing with a Gentile Babylonian, Gentile, with a Gentile Babylonian kingdom, Gentile Babylonian empire, so he deals with Gentile nations. Daniel was absolutely unswerving in his own religious convictions, yet totally loyal to his idolatrous king. So much so, he was trusted with the affairs of the empire. A tremendous example to all of us, brethren. Now, Daniel prophesies of Gentile kingdoms uh, to time of that will exist and rule to the times of Christ's return. So that's why he is not listed among the prophets. You see, he deals with Gentiles. Then we have the book Ezra and Nehemiah, which is now, there are now two books, but they were actually originally one book. These books, they depict the restoration of Jerusalem. Ezra returned from captivity to reinstitute God's way and make Jerusalem God's center. The temple and wall of Jerusalem are rebuilt in his time, and Ezra emphasizes things relating to the temple. Nehemiah, as governor, emphasizes the civil matters of Jerusalem. Then we have chronicles or genealogies. They're written from the point of view of the Levitical priesthood. Its purpose is to show the importance of Jerusalem, that it was the headquarters of the, poli of the political and spiritual entity of God. Now emphasis is on Judah, in particular on David and the temple. You know, Solomon and the four righteous kings of Judah, there are four righteous kings of Judah, were Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah and Josiah. So uh, we have this particular uh, focus in the books of Chronicles. And the genealogies cover the period from Adam to the Jews' return from captivity. It's a summary of all previous sacred history. The last chapter of Second Chronicles actually leads directly to Matthew 1. And then we come to the Gospels and Acts, which are all together five books. Obviously, you realize that that's the... Uh, illustration or parallel to the five first five books in the Bible, the first five books in the Pentateuch, uh, the ones we just covered. Uh, 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 we covered those, of course, there are four books and then comes then comes uh, uh, Joshua and entering of Israel into the, into the promised land. So here we have a parallel. There are four accounts of the life of Jesus Christ because Christ's sacrifice and message are of primary importance to the understanding of the Bible's purpose. Four authors wrote a comprehensive description of Christ in person, preaching the good news of God's coming kingdom and sacrificing himself so we can enter into the kingdom. Matthew, the gospel account, this book was written to Jewish Christians. Its purpose was to show Christ is the king of the Jews. And in the genealogy, the line of King David only is shown back to Father Abraham, father of the tribe of the tribe of Judah. Now, in that very gospel account of Matthew, in uh, chapter 2, in the second chapter, so Magi ask, where is the king of the Jews? As your obedience to the law is emphasized in Christ as king, those two things are emphasized. Now, kingdom of heaven is used rather uh, rather than of God, so it speaks kingdom of heaven rather than kingdom of God, because Jews didn't like using God's name unnecessarily. Even to this day, they try to avoid the name God, and they say Hashem, meaning the name. So, uh, 
This book is set against the background of Pharisees, as we can see in chapters 5 and in chapter 23. And the cities of Israel are not visited until the Son of Man comes. And the inscription on the cross in Matthew's account is King of the Jews. So those are all the elements. They are not false. They are just the elements that are emphasized in the Gospel of Matthew. In the Gospel of Mark, this book was written to the Gentiles to show that Christ is the Son of God. Now Christ as a servant is emphasized in Mark 10 verse 45. Mark had to explain what certain phrases meant that the Gentiles would not have naturally understood. We find examples in uh, Mark 5 verse 41, Mark 7 verse 2, Mark 10 verse 46, and Mark 15 verse 42. The baptism and transfiguration of Christ shows him as the Son of God. And compared to Matthew, when Christ went into the temple to cleanse it, Matthew is the house of prayer, but Mark is the house of prayer for all nations. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke wrote to Theophilus uh, and to all Greeks, so obviously his audience is not Jewish. Uh, so he wrote to this Theophilus, he is a man of rank, ex excellent and well off. Now written, it's written in a higher Greek than the regular colloquialism. Book of Luke and Acts are actually an important link because the author of, of both is there. And Luke shows Christ the Savior for the whole world. And Acts show the, Christ, the church goes to the whole world. Now the genealogy is back to God and Adam. In chapter 2 verse 14 and uh, chapter 2 verse 31 and chapter 24 and 47. Those verses include all people everywhere. So Luke has more parables and statements dealing with the rich. Because of the audience indeed. Of the audience to which he was writing. For example you have... Uh, chapter 12 in that gospel. So Luke leaves out the name Gentiles, lost sheep of the house of Israel, etc. <laughs> now the gospel of John. Now the gospel of John is interesting because it was written at the end of the first century when John was released for Patmos. Now heresy had already set in and there were splits in the church by this time as we see in John's first epistle chapter 2 verse 19. Diotrephes did not accept John. Gnosticism was prevalent. Logos meant reasoning. John was writing to Asia Minor, we can see that in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, where there were many Jews and Gnostics. He showed that Logos was Jesus Christ. The general feeling was Christ was not necessarily necessary to reveal God. Now in the uh, Gospel of John, the verse, first verse, that first verse shows immediately that Christ was necessary. And the Roman proconsul lived in Pergamos, wherein lay the seat of power, Revelation 2.12, John knew they would understand his description of Christ as the source of justice, the two-edged sword. Then we have the book of Acts. The book of Acts, this book continues with the work of Jesus Christ, that of, that of preaching the good news of the God's coming kingdom, not in person, but through his spirit, as we see in Acts chapter 2. And uh, right now is the... Uh, Pentecost weekend, so I'm glad that I'm delivering this uh, kind of out of order or unplanned a little message to you just to help you understand the purpose of each book of the Bible. So uh, the book of Acts is the continual preaching of the good news of God's coming kingdom, but Jesus Christ is not doing it in person. He's doing it through his spirit working in his church, which received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, on the day that will come in this calendar year tomorrow. Jesus Christ, of course, preached directly to the house of Israel, but since his sacrifice destroyed the barrier between the Gentiles, Acts largely deals with the gospel to Gentiles. Then we have the general epistles, and those general epistles are seven books in our New Testament canon. It's James, 1st and 2nd Peter, of course, 1st, uh, 2nd and 3rd John, and also the epistle of Jude. So, we have the general epistle, seven books all together. The book of James, that book was written to establish the beginning of a foundation on which the rest of the New Testament could be understood, especially those books hard to be understood, the writings of Paul. The tone closely resembles that of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a book on Christian living, obeying the intent of the law of God, and more similarly between James' teachings and Christ's than any other New Testament author. So basically, <coughs> this book has, the, the Epistle of James, has more similarity between 
uh, Christ's teachings and the, the teaching of the very author James than any other New Testament author has displayed in his writings. Now, the second in, in those general epistles is First Peter. The word Peter, as you know, the name means small rock. It's a general epistle that gives instruction to specific categories of people, for example, servants, husbands, wives, elders. Suffering as a Christian is the main theme of First Peter. Suffering is necessary to grow as a Christian, to become perfect, to cease from sinning and to glorify God. Second Peter, the general epistles, you see, they deal with very fundamental Christian doctrines in order that Christians will be stable and not waver. Five books among the general epistles demonstrate why being grounded in the truth, in the faith, is so important. Heresies, because heresies would endeavor to unset, unseat Christians from the church. And brethren, those of you who have uh, been following my uh, my ministry service, I, I, I rather like the word service rather than ministry, those of you uh, who know me also as a preacher, do you know how quickly and swiftly I always react to any heresies, brethren? To any heresies, now you see why, because I've always told you, if we are not grounded in the faith, in the truth, heresies would endeavor to unseat you and me from the church. And that's not what we want. Second Peter shows in chapter 1 how it is possible never to fail and then continues with predictions of false teachers, their practices and their end. First epistle of John is the fourth of those seven, uh, of those uh, seven general epistles. And, uh, first John was, John was responsible for canonizing the New Testament along with Peter. By 90 AD, much error has had, had crept into the church, and John's purpose was to describe the, the Antichrist and what true love really is. The true love really is the keeping of the commandments. In his second epistle, Second John, whether this letter was written to a real personality or describes an analogy, does not matter. The purpose was definitely to exhort church members to continue obeying what they first learned and to beware of deceivers. The third epistle of John, well, heresy again is the topic. You see, brethren, if we are not grounded in the faith, in the truth, heresy can so easily get us out, get us off the track, get us off the way and get us out. So heresy had become so strong in some areas that true followers were not allowed in the doors of churches where ministers had deceived the majority of their congregations. And the seventh epistle of Jude, Jude describes in detail those who are heretics, comparing them to evil examples in the Old Testament and their end. He exhorts the brethren to earnestly contend for the faith initially delivered to the saints. Then there are the epistles of Paul. There are 14 books altogether in that section. And we can basically uh, divide those epistles, those 14 books, into two sections. One section would be church epistles, epistles, so the, the, the letters to the church, and the other would be pastoral, pastoral epistles. Now, the church epistles would be Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and the book of Hebrews. Yes, there are many polemics out there who wrote the book of Hebrews, but from the style and the way it was written, it's obvious, and from the uh, great academic knowledge displayed in that epistle, it's obvious that its author is the Apostle Paul. Now, church epistles, Romans. The theme of this book is justification, how we are made right. Not by the law of Moses, but by Christ. However, the subject is not law or grace, but rather by which we are justified. Paul answers basic questions engendered by a traditional Jewish background on such subjects as circumcision and Abraham, Christ's sacrifice, the reason for the law, God's spirit, God's calling, Christian living, the civil law, fasting and meats offered to idols, all in relation to justification by Jesus Christ. So it's God's mystery revealed. And it's a wonderful mystery revealed. Uh, it'll be even the topic of my today's Sabbath sermon about the Apostles of the Gentiles and the House of Israel. 
when he the mystery revealed is that all people, all nations, all Gentiles will be grafted into Israel, and all of them will then, of course, become Israel read by spirit, and then they will be saved. Interesting, wonderful, marvelous mystery. That's why I found it, and that's why the library, which promotes and preserves all these truths, I've named the library the Hope of Israel. Because the hope of Israel, which is the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ, indeed, is exactly the same hope that is shared by all the other nations. The second church epistle is 1 Corinthians, in which Paul deals with many church problems. At least twice he defends his apostolic authority. The main problem dealt with is division because of following men, incest and the church's leavened attitude, settling differences in the church, marriage, food offered to idols, church disorders at gatherings, spiritual gifts, tongues in particular, and the resurrection. That's why we have the resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because some are claiming that the resurrection already happened. 2 Corinthians, Paul has many objections in this epistle. He comments on the first epistle concerning the man put out of church, defends his apostleship and suffering in the ministry. Because of church trials, Paul again assures the membership of the hope of the resurrection, which is of course the hope of Israel. All Israel will that ever died since wilderness, since being brought out of the end of, land of Egypt until now, all Israel that will not experience the return of Jesus Christ will be resurrected, as we read in the book of Ezekiel. The church epistle Galatians, in which in that epistle Paul establishes his authority in the ministry and proceeds to explain how we are justified by grace and not the law. All law has its purpose, but only through Christ we are saved. This book does not, however, do away with the law. The uh, epistle to Ephesians, the church of God with Gentiles and Israelites alike is one church through Jesus Christ having access to the promises of eternal life. The church will remain one through government and obedience to God's ways, standing against Satan the devil. In the epistle to Philippians, Paul encouraged the Philippians, telling them his suffering in prison help, helped to further the gospel, that humility was the example Christ left us, and we should beware of those who boast of their physical talents and abilities and press toward our spiritual goal being content with what we have in this life. In the church epistle Colossians, this letter emphasizes the preeminence of Jesus Christ. You see, ascetics in Colossus Colossi urged the keeping of traditions, Gentile traditions, of course, not keeping the words and ways of Christ, which symbolized Christ's kingdom being established. In 1 Thessalonians, the coming of Jesus Christ is the main theme of that epistle. Suffering and tribulations were experienced by these members. The return of Christ was the reason to bear up under the under these problems and continue to obey. In 2 Thessalonians, their willingness to endure persecution was the manifestation of their worthiness to be in God's kingdom. Now, the actual coming of Christ will be preceded by a falling away and the man of sin revealed. Paul admonishes the brethren to wait patiently and stay away from brothers who are not obeying. And finally, in the book of Hebrews, it's a letter to Jews to actually help them understand Christ's position as high priest, how the temple and priesthood of the Old Testament were only types of Jesus Christ and the new covenant people. Now, in pastoral epistles, there are several pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon, and the purpose of those epistles, of course, are there clearly. In First Timothy, it's a letter to uh, a young, young minister, Timothy, on how to minister to a church. Paul starts by showing the reason for God's commandments, our attitude toward men's governments, instruction for men, women, ordination of elders and deacons, doctrines of devils, and other basic admon admonitions to members, widows, elders, slaves, and the rich. In 2 Timothy, Paul, that's Paul's last letter to Timothy, encouraging him to remain strong and again avoid picky questions. He tells of the attitude in the last days, warns of future heresies, and pronounces his final words, perhaps just before he died. In, the, in Titus, basically the content of the epistle to Titus is much the same as 
First Timothy, uh, instruction on appointment of leaders, examples of different age groups in church, attitude toward government, avoiding foolish questions, and the handling of heretics is actually what is described in that uh, letter to from from the penned by the apostle Paul from the apostle Paul, and finally in the pastoral uh, letter to Philemon. Paul wrote this book to intercede with Philemon to forgive Onesimus, the runaway slave. Now, letter is a perfect example of courtesy, tact, delicacy, and generosity. And finally, we have the book of Revelation. <laughs> the book that many find as mysterious and apocalyptic. Well, the Revelation means what it means. It means to reveal, to uncover to present. So this book was written to show what the attitudes of the churches were at the time, at the time as prophecy for attitudes in today's churches and to show religious and political conditions at the end time. It's a very rich book, by the way. It describes the first and the second beast, describes their work in this current world. It describes the patience of the saints, which is keeping the commandments of God and heavy faith, having faith of Christ. It describes persecution of the uh, church that will be fleeing to the place of safety. It describes the war that Satan will war on the remnant remaining seed of the church. Finally, it describes the return of Jesus Christ, uh, the marriage of the Lamb or the supper of the Lamb, and also the new heavens and the new earth. So, friends and brethren, I hope that this review of the books of the Bible and uh, the purpose of each book will be very encouraging to all of you. Thank you very much and until next time, goodbye friends.